to go ahead and get started with our program today. Hello, everyone, and thank you for being with us today. My name is Brandi Pratlow, and I'm the Vice President of Programs and Services at the Steve Fund. Welcome to our community conversation, Understanding the Impact, How the End of Affirmative Action May Impact the Mental Health of College Students of Color. This is the first in a series of webinars over the next few months, and we'll share a little bit more information about our plans at the end of this webinar. Um, before we get started with our, the incredible conversation we have planned for you today, I'd like to share a bit more about the Steve Fund. The Steve Fund's mission is to promote the mental health and emotional well-being of young people of color as they transition from adolescence into higher education throughout their higher education experience and as they transition into the workforce so that they can attain personal, academic, and career success and achieve their full potential. We would like to thank the American Council on Age Education, ACE, for sponsoring this conversation and partnering with us. Um, and we'd also appreciate the generous support of Morgan Stanley for its support of this program. As we are engaging in this conversation today, please feel free to enter your questions or comments into the chat. We'll have a time at the end of the program to address some of these questions. Without further ado, I'd love to introduce our moderator for today's panel, Dr. Carlota Ocampo, who is the Provost and Vice President of Academic Affairs and Associate Professor of Psychology at Trinity Washington University. Carlota, it's your thank turn. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to the Seed Fund and um, the American Council on Education for hosting this webinar. So, um, College is, as we know, such an exciting time in a young person's life. It's a time when, you know, that late adolescent, early adulthood period, when students get to just explore, you know, who they are and begin to develop, learn the things that they want, variety of different things, and test their newfound independence. And at the same time, for many students, for all students, coming to a college campus can also be accompanied by stressors. They're in a new environment. They're outside sometimes of the house, sometimes for the first time. They're, they have new responsibilities that they didn't have in high school. Um, they have you know, new environments to navigate. And so it's stressful. For students of color, the research continually shows that there are even more stresses that are laid on top of the ones that other students experience. And just like people of color in society as a whole, there is an extra cognitive layer that these students are constantly negotiating as they enter different kinds of institutions of, uh, with students, often that are very different from the ones that they have, may have known in their home environments. And um, so for students of color, structural inequalities, racial bias and discrimination can really make this period extra challenging. Um, to, to emphasize that point, I wanna read um, the American Psychological Association just put out a policy statement on um, inclusive student admissions in higher ed, and they cited psychological studies published within the last four years examining over 80,000 students across 100 universities that suggest that racial and ethnic minor minority students regularly experience acts of discrimination in the educational setting. And additional studies, of course, show that um, these experiences, experiences are predictive of poor physical health, poor academic outcomes, increased depression, and lower graduation rates. So students of color entering higher education have um, an additional set of circumstances that they, have, that they have to navigate and that they have to learn about. Now, our students coming into higher education right now have recently traversed what you know I like to call a trifecta. So there's been an economic downturn, uh, which has often disproportionately affected their families and communities. They've undergone the pandemic, which is a whole other set of traumatic experiences. And they've also been exposed to and undergone sometimes personally an increase in racialized violence because our society is seeing an increase in racialized violence or at least an increase in the tele televised racialized violence um, and violence through social media um, that is you know, sort of reaching everyone. And now on top of that, the, the continued erosion of their civil rights. So to contextualize this, I view this period as a post-reconstruction post nadir. 
So, you know, history goes in cycles and our country experienced a post-Civil War reconstruction followed by a, a nadir and a retrenchment. You know, Jim Crow laws, seg it's a legal segregation, apartheid. We, you know, went through a period of a real apartheid set of laws. And then we emerged into civil rights and we, you know, went through a variety of social changes um, around an increase in civil rights and in increasing value around diversity and around making sure that all citizens can fully participate in our society. And um, what many are experiencing now is a retrenchment of that, a post-post-civil rights reconstruction of nadir again. Now, what does this mean? So the overturn of affirmative action, which has been in place for 40 years, for the purpose of promoting diversity in college admissions is likely to result in a dramatic reduction of students of color um, in selective institutions, but many students of color are gonna be turned off to education altogether. And based on experiences in states that have already banned affirmative action like Michigan and California, this new ruling suggests that fewer students are gonna be entering higher ed and what we're doing here today with the Steve Fund is asking questions, how is this going to impact the mental health and emotional well-being of our students of color in higher education? So what might this mean for their mental health? What might this mean for their sense of belongingness for those who remain on campuses or matriculate into higher ed? What are the risks of this policy change to not just students, but also faculty and staff? What are some ways as higher ed leaders can we recommit to principles of equity and social justice and create seamless, seamless, seamless pathways for our students of color to be able to fully actualize during their college experiences within staying within the letter of the law? And how are students responding to the decision? We always have to pause and remember, we have to ask the students themselves, how do you feel about this and how are you responding to it? So these are just some of the questions that we're gonna be talking about today with um, a, a panel of, of really exceptional um, individuals who are in working in this higher education space. And I'm just so pleased to be with them and with you. And we hope that we're gonna have a very interactive discussion. So with uh, that, I'm going to introduce um, our panelists and I, I'm gonna turn it over and they're gonna introduce themselves. And I'm gonna first turn it over to Dr. Kevin Coakley and then to Dr. David, David Rivera. So Dr. Coakley. Thank you, Dr. Ocampo. Um, greetings, everyone. Uh, my name is Dr. Kevin Coakley, and I am the University Diversity and Social Transformation Professor of Psychology at the University of Michigan, uh, where I have been um, now for, for about a year. Uh, previously, I was at the University of Texas at Austin, where I was um, there for 15 years. Um, so my research uh, during the course of my 25 year career has focused primarily on examining the psychological and social sort of experiences of African-American and other students of color as they navigate and negotiate predominantly white spaces. I have been particularly concerned about what are the factors that impact their academic achievement? Uh, what are the factors that impact their academic motivation, their academic self-concept, their academic self-efficacy, and, and their identity? And I have really long focused on how the environment itself impacts those very important psychological and emotional variables. Um, I have found in, in recent years that there have been um, experiences that perpetuate certain of, some of the experiences of self-doubt that students have, and I'm gonna get into that um, momentarily. But, but in short, my career and my research has really focused on understanding the ways in which the environment impacts students of color and most importantly, what can we do to change the environment so that students of color can maximize their potential? Whoops, got to remember about that mute button. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cookley and Dr. Rivera. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, I'm currently an associate professor of counseling at uh, Queens College in the City University of New York system, where I've worked within the system for about 20 years at a variety of institutions. Um, I currently direct our mental health and school counseling master's programs there. Uh, but my career in higher ed has spanned and started out actually in student affairs, 
where I was directing access and success programs primarily for uh, people of color at highly selective institutions. Um, and then I've had a lot of work in advising leadership development, and then I've parlayed myself over into the academic world, um, and now I kind of have my feet in both worlds. Um, I also have experience working at nearly every type of institution out there, community college, uh, public land grant state, um, urban, suburban, rural, um, Ivy League, highly selective, and very open access um, public. And so I bring kind of that 360 degree, if you will, view of higher education with me. <clears throat> and that really is what's motivated me, <clears throat> excuse me, to continue my work in higher education. I'm a first generation going college student myself, Mexican American from a rural background, very poor background. And so I see reflections of myself in the students that I work with and in these issues that I am, have been working on research wise. Um, I've been studying cultural competency development, broadly speaking, a focus on microaggressions um, has been um, a major part of my, my work. And <clears throat> a lot of my work was uh, geared towards higher ed in particular, but as I started to realize that every institution in this country, higher ed, the criminal ju uh, justice or injustice system, the uh, healthcare system, um, the economic systems, et cetera, all have a similar fashion to how they were shaped and who they were shaped for, right? Knowing that it's people of color and other marginalized groups who are often purposely left out of these institutions. And even as they were, who were being accepted and included, still have uh, lots of barriers put in our way, such as some of these recent decisions coming from legislatures and the Supreme Court. So that's what sort of brings me here. And I have a lot more to say about that. Thank you. Thank you to you both. And since we just have a a couple of seconds, I, I will mention that I've also been active in this um, uh, inclusive excellence and promoting um, driving actions for racial equity in higher education for a while. And I want to tell a little quick um, vignette uh, that one of my professors at Howard University taught me when we were studying um, the impact of racism on college campuses and what a student of color might experience rolling up on a co college campus. So this is taken from actual experience and it starts with a young woman of color is um, enrolling in a college campus and her family has come to drop her off and she's crossing the street, holding hands with her nieces, her little niece and nephew. And as she's walking across the street, some um, other students roll by in a car and shout out the window, I bet you don't know who the fathers are. So that's what we would call an experience of individual racism, an individual level experience of racism or if you will, racial prejudice. But then the student goes to try to enroll in her classes and she has to take a required um, uh, history seminar. And the only history seminar that's available that she can take is, is a seminar in Western culture and history. There's no other content available to her. And that's a required course. So that's an example of cultural racism. Finally, she's going to enroll in this first year seminar and there's no seats left. And so she's being told that she might have to wait and take this at another time because there's no seats left. Well, she hears about some other students who have gone to the professor and asked, you know, there's no seats left in your class, but I need to take it this semester to stay on track and graduate on time. Can you let me in? And those students have been permitted to go into the class. But when she goes to ask the professor, can I enter? The professor says, no, your, your skills are probably not up to par with this class. You have to start in the remedial class. And that's, uh, that's an example of, of institutional racism. So these are just examples of three different kinds of experiences this, that a student of color can have on campus. And each one is going to carry with it an emotional impact. Um, Dr. Coakley, as, we, as I just mentioned, um, some people will say that even before the recent Supreme Court affirmative action ruling, racial bias and negative stereotypes of students of color uh, were common occurrences in the college setting. Students of color sometimes experience a sense that they don't belong uh, because they feel like they're being marginalized. Given your research in this area and conversations with students, can you tell us a little bit, bit about what you would um, kind of distill as the lived experience of students of color on a college campus? Certainly, thank you. Thank you for the question. So. As we know, students of color have long contended with predominantly or historically white college environments where they have dealt with perceptions that they were only there because of quotas or affirmative action. And 
one of the main contributors um, to these perceptions is the role that standardized tests have played. Now, of course, it is, is well documented that certain groups of students of color, typically African-American and Latinx and Latin students, often have lower standardized test scores um, when compared to their white and Asian um, counterparts. Now, standardized tests are often wrongly assumed to be proxies for intelligence. So students of color have to live under the specter that they likely have lower test scores, which they know will make other students and faculty often view them as less intelligent and thus less deserving to be there. And what I have observed um, in my years of teaching is that sadly, it has been the case that many students of color are often very self-conscious about the test scores and they are ashamed to discuss them. I can tell you in my, I, I teach a class called the psychology of the African-American experience and I've taught it for, for many years. And when we get to the section on education, you know, one of the topics that we talk about is standardized tests. And of course we, mm -hmm. we talk about uh, Claude Steele's stereotype threat and another um, important social psychological constructs. But one of the questions that I will ask my class is, if we were to go around now and um, and have people tell everyone in the class what your your standardized test score was, you know what what was your you know ACT score or SAT score? Um, how many of you would feel comfortable doing that? And as you might imagine, um, virtually none of my students of color uh, will will do that. And, and of course I would not have them do that. But the point is is that they there is a there's a stigma attached mm -hmm. to those scores. And they know how people see them um, based on their oftentimes um, lower scores. And it's it's and I believe, you know, and I would welcome any dissent if if, if people disagree with me, but I but I believe that that many of our students have secretly internalized beliefs about not being as competent or intelligent as other students because of these doggone test scores. Now, mm -hmm. I, I I will say that, you know, one of the things that I'm really proud of with my alma mater, so I graduated from Wake Forest University um, mm -hmm. many, many years ago, uh, 1991. <laughs> and one of the things that I'm very proud of about my alma mater is, is that for some time now, they have done away with the use of standardized test scores. Now, Wake Forest University, is what you might consider to be, you know, a, a pretty elite university, and yet they made the decision, you know, some time ago that these standardized test scores are are really problematic, and they are particularly mm -hmm. problematic in in the pursuit of diversity. And plus, we know that in terms of just validity data, that there is very little predictive validity beyond um, the first year. So they made the decision right. to not use or require standardized test scores. Kudos to them. And there have been other universities across the country that have made that same decision. And I applaud them because that, that's not an easy decision to make, particularly given you know, the role of um, rankings and, and the role that standardized test scores have mm -hmm. in, in um, college rankings. And we know how important rankings are to universities. But, but they made that decision. And I think that is a decision that is very important, particularly for, for creating environments that are, are welcoming, that are inclusive, that are not stigmatizing so that students don't have to live under the specter of, I wonder if people are looking at me as, as having a lower standardized test score and not belonging. Now, I, I, I would also, I should also sort of add, and I didn't, I didn't explicitly address this in my, sort of introduction to myself, one of the uh, areas of research that I'm best known for over the past 13 years or so is, is something called the imposter phenomenon. And, and the imposter phenomenon, of course, is this idea of a, a belief that that one is, is intellectually fraudulent, that, that one is, in, in spite of one's competence and achievements, that one has, has somehow managed to fool people into believing and seeing themselves as being more intelligent and competent as they really see themselves. And I have been examining this idea of the imposter phenomenon, particularly within the context of um, students of color navigating predominantly white spaces. 
Now, it should it should go without saying that that experiences of racism can fuel these internalized beliefs and feelings of self-doubt or imposter feelings. And, and we know that while over 80% of all students, regardless of their background, over 80% of all students report feeling like an imposter, my research suggests that imposter feelings are distinctly racialized for Black students and other students of color. So in other words, when white students feel like imposters, it generally has nothing to do with their social identities as, as white people. It's, it's typically more along the classic understanding and definition of feeling like an imposter. But when students of color feel like imposters, it is quite often and likely attached to their social identities as students of color. It, someone, you know, something, some cues within the environment that make them feel like you don't belong here. Um, you are simply here because of a quota or affirmative action. And so I believe that imposter feelings for students of color are distinctly racialized. And as such, we need to address especially what's going on in the environment. I, I'll stop there. Wow. No, that was an amazing um, explanation and discourse. And I just wanted to, I mean, I, you know, I used to do a talk called um, Standardized Testing, Maintaining the Appearance of Democracy in an Institutionally Racialized Society. Um, you know, the, the strongest correlate of, of, of tests is uh, socioeconomic status. So basically what a test is mostly telling us is that you're um, in, you know, you're um, admitting students who can pay their bills, which is an important consideration for higher ed, but um, it's not necessarily an indicator of intelligence at all. And it's really unfortunate that um, our society has been come to view it that way. And as you mentioned, the way that that Im impacts people's self-perception I mean, I wouldn't tell you what my GR, GRE scores were. And let me tell you, I have a PhD in neuropsychology, but you know, no. <laughs> so, <laughs> but that's, that's a great um, example of how much anxiety, you know, people carry with them within these spaces. Um, Dr. Rivera, Dr. Rivera, uh, our nation has been struggling with issues of race throughout history and the struggle has intensified. Um, rights are being stripped away. Uh, college campuses continue to be a microcosm of society. Um, you've often lectured on the socio-ecological model. How does that concept uh, apply in this context? And with that, you know, we, we, if we can, you know, maybe define for our audience a little bit, what are microaggressions, what stereotype threat, um, you know, what experiences uh, may increase among students of color in the af aftermath of this decision? Thank you, Dr. Ocampo. And uh, Dr. Coakley, I just want to thank you, like I, I hope I always do, uh, about your research, and especially on imposter phenomenon, because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people out there that don't want us talking about imposter phenomenon or want us to think about it in not the way that you have so systematically laid out via your research, so very empirically based. And I know I still feel like an imposter in many settings. I feel like it less here because I can see both of you. We know representation matters. So in this space right here, Absolutely. I don't feel like one, but I still feel like one a little bit. And in terms of test scores, I took the ACT. I'm from Wyoming, so we did the ACT there. I did worse the second time. That rarely happens. Usually the practice effect guarantees it. So if you can imagine just how worse I felt the second time around, and I didn't even tell folks that for the longest time. Um, once I started realizing and understanding um, a lot because of the research coming out of Dr. Coakley's office and many others that, again, and what Dr. Ocampo just stated is that this is really an indicator of, of wealth, right, and socioeconomic status and not so much about intelligence, mm -hmm. then I started to shed some of those feelings related to how I started to internalize that. I was also placed in what was called remedial reading in first grade when I already knew how to read, <laughs> and that was because of my last name. Right. And so all those things have been internalized and still come up to me as a I got my PhD from an Ivy League institution. I'm not about, I'm not ashamed to share that or I'm actually very proud of it. Um, but to have that and also to be a tenured professor at this point kind of negates all of that. But those are still very much alive and well in me. So this is kind of the point I wanted to to make not only for you two who understand that very well, but for the entire audience of, of listeners here that we're talking about the experience of everybody in this country. Right now, you know, in our conversation, um, students of color are the ones being attacked, but it has an impact uh, wide reaching on, on everybody. So that goes to the ecological model. I like to base every concept and nearly every con uh, conversation 
in the socio-cultural um, ecological model. You know, many of us were inspired by uh, Yuri Brumfenbrenner's uh, work on social ecology, first bringing that into kind of understanding um, uh, human development and what impacts that. Um, and so I, I kind of base it off of that, where we, of course, we have kind of the individual in the middle, and then surrounded by the individual are the communities that we're embedded in that have an impact on how the individual develops based off of absorbing, obviously, those norms in the community, uh, the treatments, um, various access to the institutions in that local community is going to have a big impact on how the person then develops. But then with our communities um, have institutions, right? And so uh, many of us are talking about the institution of education and higher education. And that all has a set of different ideals and, and issues that might be brought up for somebody if we think about imposter phenomenon, for example, or stereotype threat, which is the idea that you know stereotypes about marginalized folks are so strong that even if we don't believe them, we've internalized some of those issues. There's a reason why I still kind of have that imposter phenomenon. There probably is a there is a part of me that still doubts some of my my my, my successes and my intellect because it's so damn strong and it's reinforced nearly every day of our lives, right? And so we have the institutions that have an impact on our communities and vice versa and on people. And then we have the larger um, kind of uh, what I like to call the social policy, uh, political policy um, 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 uh, 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 sphere. I was looking for the, uh, the correct S word, sphere. And that impacts everything, right? And, and that's where you know, maybe Brom from Brenner's um, conceptualization didn't go as so deeply into policies, but I conceptualize policies and laws and even just the rhetoric, which means just the talk, the way we talk about it, right? To be some of the most harmful things that, that impact all of our institutions, all of our communities, and thus all the individuals. And then another part of the model that is often not spoken about is the um, backdrop or the overlay of the historical context, right? There's, we need to historicize everything. When we think about affirmative action, for example, we need to backtrack that to where did it come from? Why did it come? How long ago did it emerge? It actually didn't even emerge. If you look at the, the history of higher education just in this country, right? It's a few centuries old. Affirmative action just came how many decades ago, right? Maybe five decades ago or so. So only uh, later on into the history of higher education. So when I historicize it, I think about you know how long the history of higher education has been there, how deeply seated the institutional structures, policies, and norms are, and how I, I said specifically why I've worked at all the places I've worked at because I've seen the same system replicated at the um, urban two-year community college to the four-year land-grant uh, institution to the Ivy League institution, all the same structure. Has different people going around and what have you, but all the same structure, so it's gonna produce the same dynamic, right? I might have went off a little bit, but I think it's important that we couch ourselves in the ecological model and we don't forget about the history. One fallacy that people have internalized is that we learn from history. We don't learn from it, right? We need to start learning from it, and that's why we need to start historicizing and remember remembering the, the background. And when we think about the, um, the impact of this latest um, Supreme Court decision on affirmative action, uh, we have previous studies that have um, analyzed um, previous affirmative action rollbacks, right, in California and in Michigan. And what did them show? A lower increase, or a, low, a decrease in representation for Black and Lat 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 Latinx students in particular and also an increase in um, uh, issues impacting psychological well-being, negative issues impacting psychological well-being. We can even just look at rhetoric studies, for example, um, um, against immigration. All these are connected, right? And, and any kind of rhetoric that's attacking somebody, all the studies that I've found have always shown that the negative political rhetoric elicited higher negative um, affect, right? The, high, the more that the negative political rhetoric is out there, the more negative affects, such as depression, anxiety, withdrawal, we're going to experience in our communities that we're, that we're trying to serve. So taken in concert with the many studies that have, you know, Carlota, uh, Dr. Ocampo, and Dr. Co Coakley already mentioned, that have indicated that students already perceive more racial discrimination and experience less belonging than their white student counterparts, this addition of the anti affirmative action rhetoric emboldened by the recent Supreme Court decision will likely only exacerbate what the worse and worsen the perceived and experienced race based stress for BIPOC students. You know, the research finds that when students experience a campus climate as more hostile and exclusive, 
that they are likely to experience more microaggressions. Again, the everyday, um, subtle, mostly unintentional. We don't really care about intention when we think about microaggressions, nor we should we care about it when we think about other types of discrimination. The intention doesn't matter. Even the law doesn't really care about intention because if you kill somebody while driving, you're going to be hit with manslaughter charges, right? And so even the law is, is dictating that intention doesn't matter. But when it comes to discrimination, a lot of folks would still like to focus on intent. And intent in my world doesn't matter because the pain and the hurt is already there. And so when the microaggressions are, are increased, we saw that we see that those studies always lead to a negative impact on a psychological wellness as well as educational wellness. So based off of what we know about how BIPOC students historically and currently experience their higher ed environments, we can only predict that the wellness and the educational situations for BIPOC students will worsen and in effect the psychological wellness of all students will suffer. Studies also show that it's not just the marginalized students that are going to suffer, everyone is going to suffer from this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for that very um, thorough description. And so um, you mentioned about microaggressions and you could consider the example that I gave right at the beginning of the student who's crossing the street with her nephews. That's a kind of a microaggression. And those, whether, you know, me, whether, as you said, whether intended or not, you know, people go, I didn't really mean anything by it. But, but as when you put them together into a whole and you see that students are experiencing this on a regular basis, it forms a kind of a way of saying you don't really belong here. It is a way of sort of marginalizing and excluding um, people that that may seem that they, they may even seem very small. Or why are you you know why are you getting upset about that? I don't mean anything. And yet, when they build up over time, they can really have a deep impact to lead to um, a, a feeling of I don't belong here, as well as that imposter phenomenon that we've been discussing. And you know, when you were talking about imposter phenomenon, I was thinking about. Um, Michelle Obama telling a story about how when she was in school and I mean, but she's at Princeton and all these places and yet she always felt like, you know, I mean, well, let's just say here's this incredibly accomplished woman who always felt like, wow, you know, I always felt like when, you know, when I got into the halls of power, there'd be these amazing people, you know, doing all these amazing things with all these great ideas. And then she said, and then I got there and I looked around, it was like, wow, I'm smarter than everybody in this room. You know, and I think I think that is something that, you know, is so important for us to keep in mind with respect to uh, imposter phenomenon that it is it is an illusion that there's anybody who's smarter than we are and or that people of color are, I should say, and that um, that, you know, we need to continue to show up with our authenticity. Um, even when, um, you know, we're being kind of, when we're even, even when we're being excluded and sometimes even more so. But speaking of imposter phenomenon, again, and linking that back to um, affirmative action. So Dr. Coakley, you know, one of the issues that has been raised about affirmative action is that inc it increased a sense of stigma am among students of color and added enough negative stereotypes because when they got into the campuses, the perception was, oh, you're only here because you're meeting a quota system and you don't really belong here. Um, can you talk a little bit about how that um, sense, even under affirmative action, might have impacted people? And you know, some people have raised that, uh, you know, some prominent people have raised that as a reason why we don't need affirmative action anymore. So what are your thoughts about that, um, that uh, line of argument? Yeah, thank you for the question. And you know, this this is a a a, a complicated question. Um, so to be sure, self doubt among students of color may have been associated with their awareness of being supported by affirmative action policies. I mean, I think that we would uh, be naive to completely deny that. But and this is the the social scientists in me coming out. I I am very careful in in, in the language that I use. So in other words. I will never say that something causes something if it has not been demonstrated empirically through a rigorous Absolutely. design. And so it would be wrong, however, to say that affirmative action caused or causes self-doubt or lack of um, sense of belonging among students of color. Now, I, I can speak to that, you know, both anecdotally and, and empirically. Anecdotally, in my 25 years of, of being a professor, at multiple universities. I started off at Southern Illinois University at Carbondale, um, which is a school that was really 
viewed at the time that I was a professor, almost like an opportunity school. Um, I went from there to the University of Missouri, Columbia, um, which was a flagship school in Missouri. From there, I um, went to the University of Texas at Austin, which of course was a flagship school of Texas. And now I'm at the University of Michigan. So I've been a professor at multiple universities over the course of my 25 year career. And I can tell you that I have never ever heard um, black students, and for that matter, any students of color, say that affirmative action made them feel inferior to other students. Not once that I have I ever heard those words uttered by any black students or other minoritized students. Now, instead, it has been the experience of being in racist environments where the intelligence of black and other uh, students of color and their deservedness to be on campus have been constantly questioned. Now, think about this. Think about what it must be like for students of color to be on a college campus where students are having, for example, an affirmative action bake sale. Mm -hmm. okay? I don't know if you all are familiar with that, mm -mm. but um, <laughs> affirmative action bake sales. So this is a type of campus protest event that, mm -hmm. that is used by conservative student groups to performatively criticize affirmative action policies by charging students different prices depending on which social or racial group they belong to. So if you are black, for example, you know, we might charge you 50 cents for a cupcake. If you are white, we might charge you a dollar for the cupcake. If you are Asian, we might charge you a dollar and 50 for the same cupcake. And when I was at the University of Texas at Austin, um, this was an event that happened during my, my time there. And this has happened um, across universities, you know, across the country. And these bake sales have been very planned, very intentional and organized uh, systematically. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they are annual events. Now, I would argue that it is these types of experiences rather than affirmative action itself that contribute to the stigma that students of color experience. So don't blame it on affirmative action. No, it's, right. it's, it's the reaction, the, it's these racist reactions and attitudes about affirmative action that result in something like an affirmative action bake sale that cause students, if, if they feel any sense of self-doubt, students of color, it's because of those reactions and that, that environmental stimuli of bias and racism and discrimination, not the policy itself, which is causing them to feel um, undeserving uh, and not belonging. So that would be the argument that, that I would make. Wow, that's that's great. You know, I really agree with you. Whenever I hear people say, well, affirmative action is causing, you know, us uh, people of color's intelligence to be questioned, it's like, well, it's not affirmative action, it's society as a whole. You know, these these attitudes are already here. We need what we need to do is fix society. And actually, what we would love to have is a society where we could say that everyone has equitable treatment. Affirmative action was established to redress unequal treatment, you know, but I have to say that that example of the affirmative action bake sale, which is blowing my mind, what a great example of a microaggression. What a great example of a threat tactic. I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I, I you know, I do want to add, you know, one other uh, sort of note here. And, and, and this is, so when the Supreme Court you know, ruled against affirmative action. And, and of course we heard from, from Clarence Thomas and, you know, he has been, you know, sort of used, you know, by um, conservatives as an example of, you know, hey, here's a black man who, you know, is against affirmative action. Uh, I will say that that one of the things that he he talked about, as, as I'm sure you all are aware, was when, when he was in law school at, at Yale University, what he says is that, that, affirmative action resulted in him having the very the worst experience imaginable because he was there and he knew that people felt like he was there only because of the color of his skin and not because of his intelligence. So he felt, so so he attributed whatever feelings of self-doubt he may have experienced, he attributed it directly to affirmative action, again, rather than the environment itself and the reactions and attitudes of those students. And so, so again, it's it's a it's about sort of causality. And again, I'm a social scientist, mm -hmm. so I don't. I will continue to argue to my last breath that it it was not the policy that caused him to feel that way. It was the reaction of his his peers that caused him to feel that way. I'll shut up now. Oh yes, um, I I think that you have a unanimous support on this panel regarding your view 
And at the same time, we have to recognize that people of color show up in all different kinds of packages with all different kinds of thought systems and cognitive systems and different kinds of intersectionalities that they bring. So, you know, again, we say POC or BIPOC people or whatever terms we're using, but we always have to remember that everybody is a unique individual with their, you know, their own background experiences that they bring to any, any kind of um, enterprise that they embark on in their lifetime, including the com uh, college campus. And with that, um, Dr. Rivera, uh, how does intersectionality play into the negative consequences of this affirmative action decision? Students who may be first generation, immigrant, LGBTQIA, other identities, in addition to being communities of color, how are they going to experience um, this decision in your view? Yeah, I think that's a great question because there's so many things going on that are being experienced as direct threats to access to a variety of life-saving uh, institutions, institutions that are necessary for people to self-actualize themselves. And um, long list, before I get into that, I wanna just jump on to um, uh, another um, issue that I think impacts how people communicate the affirmative action message, right? Um, and how, again, just like Dr. Coakley stated, and I wholeheartedly believe, it's not affirmative action in and of itself, it's the way that it's conceptualized, it's the way that, people are then treated based off of that, you know, uh, we still, and I say we very broadly speaking, I don't belong in that we, nor do I probably believe you two, uh, there's a still a strong consensus in this country, at least rhetorically speaking, that we are egalitarian, right, meaning we're equal, and that we're a meritocratic society, right, meaning that if you work for it, you're going to get it, right, and so those are two fallacies, right? Even the federal government just produces the statistics on educational attainment, on workforce representation. Just looking at those two alone, which I look at very frequently, those rarely change. You still see some people, especially white folks, are more well represented in various forms of educational attainment. And also um, in the highest levels, when I mean highest levels, those that make the most money uh, of, of, um, of, of employment, right? And we still see people of color, um, and other folks highly represented in the service industry, for example. So I don't see what's meritocratic or egalitarian about that. However, that is still a big norm that pervades this country. And so you think about that norm of thinking that we're egalitarian and meritocratic, and then we have affirmative action, which is saying, nope, this country isn't that. So we need to rectify that by making sure that we're <laughs> encouraging um, a diversity of folks in admissions to any institution that's very confusing. And so we live in this country that always has these messages that are contradictory and that cause so much more confusion. And I believe it's purposeful uh, from some folks, possibly from those that wanna keep oppression alive and well, and from those of us like us who really want to address the oppression with meaningful and empirically based um, information are stuck in this kind of, this, 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 uh, this culture um, and social um, dialogue and rhetoric that is very confusing. And so I think that it's important that we, and that's part of the historical context, right? When we think about historicizing something, what norms were they founded on? Again, they were founded by those very incorrect norms that have been set into this country several centuries ago that again, we're all equal and with a lot of hard work. And I come from, I come from the rugged uh, West, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. I kind of know what that means, literally and figuratively. And we know that doesn't work. And so going to intersectionality and connecting it to everything else going on, we can still use the social ecology model to help us understand the intersectional nature of this court decision, along with the many other legislative and court decisions and in induced impacts on our socially marginalized communities. We know that there's a growing trend for courts and legislatures to roll back access. And that's how I think about it, rolling back access to institutions that are needed to create an actual inclusive society and to promote the overall well-being and self-determination of all people. You know, there have been significant court and legislative decisions and then the rhetorics as well um, that are greatly limiting to our full participation in society and to healthcare. Um, for example, the rollback of Roe v. Wade, um, in essence, severely limits access to comprehensive reproductive health services and may even have a more detrimental, I, I say more, may even because we don't have the research yet, uh, detrimental impact on BIPOC communities who already face significant challenges to receiving culturally affirming health care. And then when we overlay other issues such as the affirmative arg uh, action argument that's targeting primarily uh, people of color, that's only gonna intensify the way people of color 
feel um, they're included in this society. Again, because that access to life-saving and um, self-actualizing resources and limiting. Additionally, there are over 500 pieces, you know, it's just growing, of legislation. It's something that I monitor on a daily basis. It's another big part of my work um, that have been introduced at the state level seeking to cut off access to life-saving, gender-affirming health care and full participation in education for LGBTQ plus communities. Now, again, these threats and resulting impacts are likely going to be more harsh for BIPOC LGBTQ plus people as we see the these legislative and um, politically induced um, issues intersecting to literally not legislatively force people uh, more into the margins, more so than we already were. So it's it's all I all I can experience that's communicating a purposeful um, exclusion from two very meaningful institutions, healthcare and education that we know are, are life-saving and needed for self-determination. Um, all I would by saying, you know, the overarching theme that I hear from all of these is a tidal wave of both potential and actualized laws and policies that seek to reduce full access and participation in life-saving and enhancing institutions. Thank you so much. You know, that ties into what I was saying right at the beginning about us being in a post-reconstruction nadir. And we did have a question from someone about, can you clarify what a nadir is? And I, I will just say that that is a, a social and political low point in a society. It's, it's a time in a society when progressive social action is reversed and, and stepped backwards. And that's typically called a nadir. And so what you just described is this nadir that we're in and I know this is not what we're talking about today, but part of this nadir is um, scaling back teaching black history and African history and the history of peoples of color in this country, including indigenous people's history and other histories. So, you know, I was taught uh, in, in college, thankfully, that, um, there, there, that there are dual narratives in the United States, at minimum dual narratives. So there's this one narrative of you know people immigrate here because unless you're indigenous you 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 know immigrated or or you were um, forcibly and captured and brought here and enslaved so that's one of the two um, and then however you know you the 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 narrative is you know the family immigrated and then there's this sort of upward trajectory and this manifest destiny and this rolling west but then there's this whole other narrative which is a narrative of oppression, of exclusion, of discrimination, of redlining, of, you know, Jim Crow, of, um, you know, enslavement. I mean, it's, it's a whole set of experiences that don't fit into that narrative of work hard and you'll get, you know, you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Not that there's anything wrong with that ideal, right? It's just not, you know, fully, fully realized. So this is another part of what we're experiencing um, that, you know, so there's a rollback in affirmative action. There's a rollback. In, there's a there's a pushback around teaching American history. That's just what I call it. And there's a rollback in many states at the state level of legislature, as you pointed out, around issues like gender affirming care or um, you know just other ways that people express their embodiments um, in in the world. Now, so all of this kind of you know turns into this big psychological cognitive kind of thing that people of color are, are pushing through. In a sense, the continuation of a long struggle, but here we are. And um, Dr. Copley, in your opinion, what will it take? Um, and, and as a researcher, um, what kinds of um, research or what will it take for us to examine the psychological consequences of this nadir and particularly the end of affirmative action. Um, you know, what are some of the um, research-based, evidence-based, um, you know, things that we can establish and implement to collect data around this emotional impact? Well, I, I you know, I would I would be remiss if I did not say that I I would love to see institutions collect longitudinal data on um, you know imposter the imposter phenomena on racial microaggressions on these experiences that we know that our students of color um, are, are, are experiencing. And I'd like to see it done systematically. And I'd like to see, see it done as a part of institutional research. You know, we know that institutional research is done and, and there are all types of data that are being collected. Why not include um, these variables as a part of the, the systematic collection of data examining these experiences 
of minoritized students. We know that they are going to be going to um, hostile environments even more so than, I would argue even more so than what has been previously the case. Um, part of what I get concerned about is that I feel like some students feel like they have been given a signal to, you know, to just have carte blanche at students of color and they can do and say anything uh, all under the guise of, of you know, freedom of speech. And, and, and I would like to see um, the impact of, of these types of environments be systematically measured and assessed amongst students of color. Um, and part of, you know, part of it is that we really have no way of knowing otherwise what the impact is if, if we don't have data. Um, and, you know, and I would say both qualitative and quantitative data. I was having a conversation with um, some Black student leaders here at the University of Michigan maybe a couple of weeks ago. And of course, you all know that, you know, we haven't had affirmative action here at the University of Michigan, you know, for, for quite some time. And and so in, in some ways, the, the, the Supreme Court verdict does not necessarily directly impact um, black students and other minoritized students here, but still the the entire national discourse um, around students of color and and their right to be on you know in these sort of spaces nevertheless still permeates the air and and they are very well aware of it. And so I was talking to these students, and I was asking them about their thoughts as black student leaders about the the impact of this ruling. And and they talked about just how how draining it is for students of color to constantly have to defend and justify their existence. Like it's just you know other students don't have to deal with that, but you know to be in situations where you know you know for them as leaders in particular they're always asked, well, what do you think? Here I am doing doing the very thing. What what do you think? Um, but have always been put in a position to have to speak for. Um, their constituencies is just very draining. Um, they talked about feeling a sense of panic, you know, not being sure exactly what it means and how it might imp impact them. So it's it's the not knowing that that is, is is a bit scary for them. And of course, as we've already talked about, they they talked about sort of how it exacerbates these feelings of imposterism. So so what I would like to see again is institutions be intentional, make it a priority to collect qualitative and quantitative data um, on students, students of color's experiences in this post-affirmative action climate. And, and then most importantly, once they get that data, to act on it. Because I, I assure you that they will find things that they probably, that will probably be disturbing. Um, but we, we won't know unless we have the data. Great, yes, thank you so much. This has been uh, just an incredibly uh, insightful discussion, and I want to thank you both for um, the incredible experience and and um, real, um, you know, deconstructionist and reconstructionist thought that you've brought to this topic. Um, we're going to shift now to um, ask to answering questions in the chat, and I did see one question that I'm going to um, ask both of you in a in a minute, but I also want to, as we um, address the questions. You know, we've sort of laid out the issues. And now what I want to ask as well is how can colleges and universities adapt to the change? Um, and so um, David or Dr. Rivera in particular, but also Dr. Cookley, um, the APA recently put out a set of recommendations about this. Um, and, you know, so maybe we can talk a little bit about that. But first I had a very interesting question from the audience, which is, um, are there differences in for Black students under affirmative action between PWIs and HBCUs? And um, how can we quantify that difference? Um, and maybe we'll start with uh, Dr. Coakley. So I, I want to make sure that, I, that I'm understanding the question correctly. So the, the question is, are there, are there differences in the experiences of black students attending? Yes, so so let me read the question exactly okay. and then I'll tell you how I interpret it. So is there a difference in how um, students of color function in PWIs versus ABC, uh, HBCUs? So is there a difference in the way that students of color are 
able to function or the way they show up or present themselves when they're at uh, HBCUs or, or, you know, I think we could also say it's not just HBCUs. We also have Hispanic serving institutions. We also have predominantly black institutions. Now, not all of these, of these institutions necessarily tend to the needs of students of color the way that they should. Certainly HBCUs have a long history of creating you know, spaces where um, students of color can come and expect to receive a great education and, and thrive. But how do you contextualize that difference? Because I think one of the things that we are seeing in the wake of this affirmative action decision is this um, incoming fall enrollment cycle HBCUs and other um, you know, minority serving institutions are experiencing an uptick in admissions inquiries. I am, um, can you hear me? We can. I, so I am include, oh, okay. I wanna include in the chat, and I don't know if it's going to everyone, a link to an article. So I just, it, it did not let me share this. Um, can I, is there a way that I can share this with, with the audience? If you can't drop it in the chat, I suggest if you have a minute to email it over to the team, they can probably get it in the chat for us. Okay, so I just published an article in the Journal of Higher Education entitled Student Faculty Interactions, University Environment and Academic Attitudes Among Black College Students, The Role of School Racial Composition. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's, it's very, the, the, so the question is actually, you know, very appropriate for, for um, given the timing of this article. And, and in the article, um, we were interested in comparing students attending historically black colleges versus predominantly white schools. And we found you know, some, some interesting findings. Um, and, and part of what we sort of came away with was that the university environment and student faculty interactions play a more important role in the academic attitudes of black students attending historically black colleges than historically or in predominantly white institutions. Um, and and I, this is build out, building off of my dissertation research that, that was done, you know, e you know, many, many years ago. Um, but one of the things that we know is that that the quality of student faculty interactions um, is typically much better for black students at historically black colleges than at predominantly or historically predominantly white institutions. And we know that the role of student faculty interactions is particularly important in the academic and psychosocial development of, of black students. And so, and, and to, to your point, Dr. Ocampo, yes, we also know that as a result of this ruling that we in, expect there to be a surge in applications at historically black colleges and universities, so much so that they are now talking about having to put a cap um, because they're not gonna be able to necessarily accommodate all the students who are now going to be applying to, to go there. Because of course, you know, given this ruling, like if I'm a black student, like why would I wanna go to a predominant white university um, where you know I believe that I'm not wanted, um, that I, people see me as not deserving to be there, and why subject myself yeah. to that? And this affirmative action ruling just really underscores that. And so, so yes, there is going to be a surge. Um, there is a surge, um, and and it, which is both good for HBCUs, but also they, they can't handle. They they simply can't accept all the applicants that will be applying, which then puts the onus back on predominantly white universities. To, that they have to do better. And, and one of the things that we see happening um, with predominantly white universities is they, they are told to look at the HBCU model and learn from them. What is it that HBCUs do with less resources, but they are doing a better job at cultivating and graduating black students. Um, and so there are some things that I think predominantly white schools can do in looking at the HBCU model that can better, that can produce, that can produce a better environment and thus better, better outcomes for, for Black students. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's considering that higher education as a whole is facing an enrollment cliff with the drop off in, in birth rates in high school graduates, it seems like a somewhat short-sighted <laughs> policy to, to um, drop affirmative action at this point. But I, I will, I, we only have a couple more minutes and I wanna um, ask uh, Dr. Rivera again about, uh, and there's one more question I wanna ask Dr. Rivera that ties into the recommendations. But I just mentioned there is some chat uh, from um, uh, 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 the audience about um, anecdotal feedback uh, around, you know, um, having gone to an HBCU and having felt really fortified and feeling like they're able to, 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 to graduate and really survive and thrive even in ma white male dominated industries uh, because of that experience that gave them a sense of um, groundedness. 
So, um, but um, Dr. Rivera, you know, you were on a part of this APA um, decision or, or um, platform uh, of statement about the affirmative action decision. And also uh, an, an attendee has asked, I would like um, to understand how um, appropriate access to true historical knowledge about mar marginalized communities and self-affirming mindsets um, can buffer experiences in a hostile environment. So what are some of the things that we can do for students who may now be going to PWIs and experiencing mm -hmm. this um, isolation and lack of belonging? Mm -hmm. uh, I'll try to answer both of those as shortly as possible. Uh, the second part that you just mentioned, how can access to historically accurate information about our communities, as well as um, accurate information about the phenomenon that our uh, BIPOC students are experiencing, such as imposter phenomenon and microaggressions and stereotype threat. That's all part of what we're now calling consciousness raising, right? Critical consciousness mm -hmm. raising is now being studied as a construct that can help liberate people, that can help people make better sense of their positionality in society um, and make better sense of what they might be able to do to alter that positionality based off of the deluge of issues that have historically and currently and down the road are probably going to come down and, and provide some attacks. And so I, I think that, again, providing accurate knowledge, whatever it is, is all about uplifting our critical consciousness. And mm -hmm. if our consciousness can be critical, if our thinking can be as critical because of that, we're going to start be, we're going to start making better decisions, right? And decisions that are going to be more accurate. Uh, for our realities, whichever reality that might be. Um, also, I'm very proud, and um, I serve on the Council of Representatives for APA, which is the legislative making body. And just a few days ago, we passed the APA policy statement on equitable and inclusive student admissions in higher education, which basically reifies what APA has always stood for, not always, I just say more recently stood for, in terms of making um, educational spaces more equitable. Um, and then it also provides some recommendations. You know, I, that's why. I, I like about EPA statements is that we back it by science, number one, making sure that it's sound, but we also offer, you know, uh, recommendations for how folks can deal with the issues. Um, one is, you know, establishing what are being called adversity scales. I'm not sure I like the, the way that those are, are, are labeled, um, but it's proposing, you know, from the White House, you know, uh, um, President Biden spoke about this, you know, where colleges take into consideration the accounts and types of adversities um, a student has overcome. Um, when, so, uh, when selecting qualified candidates, right? So taking that into consideration, reviewing portfolios. And this has been in the past. You know, I started yeah. my work in higher ed at a highly selective institution where I did admissions for my program. And this, we did really a portfolio review is what we were doing. We understood that the tests don't really mean much, right? But we were still indoctrinated into this era of testing. And so we really did do a portfolio review looking at where did these students coming from? What are the neighborhoods? One other recommendation is targeting high schools that have that are in areas that don't send students to your schools. And we also looked at that, which were the geographic areas that were highly underrepresented. And we realized those often were in um, areas that lacked access and lacked uh, financial resources. Um, so there, the other thing which I'll say, and I think that needs to be done because it was its own kind of um, affirmative action, if you will, but it's eliminating preference for wealthy um, um, uh, people, especially donors and legacy folks. That might hurt the ears of people listening or, or eyes of people uh, reading the transcript, um, but that is also a system that needs to be um, um, countered and, and um, hopefully eliminated, uh, if, I, if, I, uh, if I should say. Certainly if we want a true meritocracy, yeah. Um, so we just have about five more minutes to wrap up the discussion, and we have just a couple more questions that I'm going to kind of throw out there um, in no order. One of them is, um, actually, I want to say a little something about this. It's, um, how do you see full fee paying international students being used or abused for their diversity in the wake of this ruling? And does this ruling allow universities to sidestep their responsibility to the diverse domestic students? And I think this is something that has really come up is, does this okay, this decision applies to admissions, but does it apply to DEI initiatives? Um, and I think those are two very different things. Um, and tied to that, another question, how do you respond to people who are saying that campus DEI initiatives are indoctrination? So kind of a backlash against DEI as well. So yes, we certainly will see a decline in students of color, particularly at selective institutions, if they don't, you know, change their portfolio processes for reviewing um, admissions. 
But once they're there, do we still have a responsibility to have DEI uh, be a part of, um, you know, have DEI, be, DEI uh, initiatives be a part of their experience? I tried to say that all, you know, kind of putting it together, but what do you think about is DEI indoctrination and do we still have a responsibility to our diverse students? And also how do we protect international students? So did, did you ask us if DEI is indoctrination? It was, is that well, a question? Somebody, somebody in, the, in the chat said, um, what are our thoughts about how to, you know, respond to people who characterize DEI initiatives as a kind of indoctrination? Um, yeah, I, I, that I would strongly disagree with that. Um, the, the talk that I just gave um, at APA last week addressed this in part mm. where, I, where I talked about um, the science, the psychological science behind uh, the advantages of teaching diversity to students, particularly to children. Um, mm -hmm. in part, part of the, pre in that presentation, one of the one of the um, sort of examples that I that I gave, and I, I wish that I had it open right now so that, so that I could give you exact numbers, but I cited some studies that have been done examining this so-called indoctrination or, or what, what has been um, derogatively referred to as woke indoctrination that is you know, well, purportedly sort of taking place. And we know from, from several studies that this so-called woke indoctrination is, is basically, um, not happening that 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 there's not that when students have been interviewed about whether they are being essentially forced by their professors for example to had to adhere to certain political beliefs that 90 percent of students in one study of, of over 100 campuses 90 percent of the students said that this was not happening um and so in in the very few instances that it does happen you know clearly that should not be happening but it is not this widespread phenomenon that that some would have you believe. Um, so, so I would, I would, you know, tell people that when, when you're sort of presented with this argument about this so-called indoctrination, you know, again, I am a fact-based, data-based individual. So I ask for, show me the data because the data that I am aware of does not support this this assertion. Great. And Dr. Rivera, final word to you in one minute or less. Um, what can we do to still support the diverse students with diversity initiatives once they are in fact on our campuses? I think going back to some statements that both of you made, I encourage every leader here to make sure you talk to your students, especially your students of color about how they are uh, perceiving, making sense, and then internalizing these messages. It's going to look different from place to place. I don't like giving generalities very much, but I will say you need to talk to your students to, to understand and listen to understand as well. Try to remove the, the filters that we usually use to take in information and truly understand what are these students experiencing? What are some of the outcomes they're already reporting? And then what can I do within my power? And hopefully there are some folks here that have a lot of power, presidents, provosts, vice presidents, et cetera, to make sure that the institution is setting up interventions and methods of reducing whatever negative affect or issues the students will report or might report. I'm now putting words out there, but I just based off of the students that I spoke to, even in my little enclave of Brooklyn, very much uh, secured from a lot of the, the threats, if you will, that, that others experience, but we still mm -hmm. hear the dialogue and our students still feel as if their life within higher education is tenuous at best. Mm -hmm. Well, my goodness, this conversation has been just such a breath of fresh air in the middle of a, you know, a busy day, a busy week. We're all opening our campuses and, um, you know, really addressing and talking about these issues is, is just so important. I want to thank you both so much for your um, input. Uh, Dr. Coakley, I hope we can get a the link to that article. I'm sure we all want to read it and I'll follow your work. And of course, Dr. Rivera, you know, your work on the APA is just so so um, important and thank you so much. And um, so we've had a great uh, discussion here. I wanna thank the audience as well for your attention, participation, your great, great questions. And right before you leave, we'd like to ask you to answer a few short questions. Um, there's going to be a link in the chat or I guess you can scan that QR code there um, and uh, just evaluate this conversation. And by the way, this is just the opening conversation in a series of 
conversations that are being sponsored by the Steve Fund and the American Council on Education. Um, we do invite you to continue to attend these community conversations. Uh, please stay tuned for the uh, upcoming sessions where we'll focus on interventions to build inclusive college campuses to promote mental health and emotional well being and to support student belonging and mental health during this time of change. Uh, and Dave, uh, Dr. Rivera, I'm so sorry. Um, on that note, I think you might have something to say about the Equity and Mental Health Campus Initiative. Yeah, I was trying to do a plug for uh, the Steve Fund's Equity and Mental Health on Campus Initiative. It's now going, I believe, into its fifth year, possibly. Um, in my role with the Steve Fund, I also serve as a campus coach uh, for this program. It's a program that takes institutions on a, a cohort model, if you will, of 18 months. Institutions of a variety of settings and and a variety of geographic locations come together to really um, look at, critically analyze, um, and research what's going on that's impacting the emotional wellness of their students of color, and then to come up with action plans to critically address this. It's a lot of it's based on the Steve Fund and the Jed Foundation's equity and mental health uh, framework, which was developed a number of years ago, but that we're putting into action uh, via this, um, this program. So if you're interested at all, please contact the information there, emhc at stefund.org, and you'll be met with some really good, great information. I have not participated in a program that looks anything like this, and I can say that the cohort aspect of it is one of the powers behind it, the information sharing, and what can come out of that has just been uh, quite remarkable. So I encourage you all just to even look at the information here on our website or to reach out uh, for more information. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone again. I'm going to see, is Brandy Pretlow still here to close us out? And if not, um, I think we have pretty much done this uh, in time and on target. So thank you so, so much to everyone. And thanks again to the Steve Fund and to the American Council on Education, to our fantastic panelists. And let's keep the work going. And here's Brandy, Dr. Uh, Ms. Pretlow, sorry. Not a problem. I get, I get a little, to say, <laughs> get a little you know, comfortable. Thank you. Yes. Exactly. Thank you. And we'll see you at the next one. Take care. Yes. Everyone. Good day. Wonderful. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks.